Hello adventurers and welcome back to my channel. Today it is raining like it has been for the last three days here in Tennessee. I actually pulled into a campground a couple of days ago with every intention of vlogging the experience and showing you this awesome campground. I started off with this footage right here. And as you can see, it had a lot of promise. It looked kind of nice. I was cooking my food, I was enjoying myself, and then it downpoured, like downpoured. So needless to say, I couldn't pop up the drone. I couldn't do my normal walk around. It made it very difficult for me to cover the campground fully. I just want you guys to know that this was an amazing campground in central Tennessee and it was absolutely free. So as always, if you're interested in this campground, I will go ahead and make a written review over on The Dirt. The Dirt is my favorite place to review campsites and you can find all the campsites that I've stayed at over there as well as my full thoughts and opinions on them and a few tips for if you are going to those campsites. So again, that's the dirt and uh, yeah, without further ado, we're gonna hit the road and see what's ahead. I think that we're almost out of this rain, so it's time and long overdue for an adventure. Let's roll the intro and see what we can get into today. Okay guys, so I drove to Oak Ridge, which actually has a really amazing history here in the US and is probably one of the most fascinating cities in the entire country because it was once known as a secret city. And they have this place called the American Museum of Science and Energy. On the site it says open, but I arrived and well, there it is. It's closed guys. It's closed due to COVID. So now the question is, what do we do next? Um, this is clearly out and it's still raining, so anything outdoors would also be out. So I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and make our way toward the Smokies. I'm not sure what we're gonna find along the way. There are several things that I have been interested in, but like this, I'm not sure if they're gonna be open. So we're going to mosey on down the road and try to find the Smoky Mountains. I have something planned for us tomorrow that is on the opposite side of the Smokies. So we're definitely gonna have to get a little bit closer one way or the other. We're gonna to find something to do today. I am determined, so we are off to see what we can find. Okay guys, we finally found a destination and it's still drizzling just a little bit, but this attraction is inside, so while there are portions of it that are kind of scattered around the property, the majority of it is inside. We are at the Smoky Mountain Heritage Center, right on the entrance side where Cades Cove is. And I'm really excited because I have never stopped off here and I've never had the opportunity to come through when it's been open. But the sign is definitely on and we're going inside. Mask up guys, mask up. This is exciting because I have never gotten to come through here before. It is $10 to come through as an adult and there is one large building where we'll be making a loop through in just a moment. And then there are a lot of outbuildings that have different artifacts. So we're gonna start off in here with some of the finds that they have found along the highway when they were excavating. Now, as we go through this area, you can see behind me, there are several exhibits that show not only the items that they found, but also how they found them. And then there's also information you can read along the walls right here about what it is to do an archeological dig and what they expected to find and what they learned from that. So as we kind of go through here, I'm gonna show you a lot of the different things and tell you a few of them but I definitely recommend stopping off here because there's a lot of information in this one hall alone. It would take a whole video just to cover the cool stuff that you can find in here. 
Like right here, it shows the post molds. The post molds are the remains of wooden posts placed in the ground used for construction of houses. And you can see what that might have looked like as they excavated it down here. Now this photo right here is especially interesting because that's what it would have looked like when they widened the highway and discovered this. So this is the Townsend area. And right here is the highway that we drove in on. And then look at this, all of this was uncovered. Now, of course, from all of this, they're able to put together a little bit more of a timeline. And that's what this row right here does. It tells you a little bit more about the timeline itself and the contributions that the Native Americans might have been making at that time. There's some little interactive things like this, where you can ask a question and pick it up and find out the answer. Those are always really fun. So it's a good place to come in and get a really good idea of what was going on at the time and then why this was such a cool find. For example, the earliest plants domesticated by local people, native peoples, are often referred to as the three sisters because, here's the answer, the stalks of corn acted as trellis to support the beans while the squash planted between the corn rows provided shade for the soil. So they were all codependent. Now the four major groups that were in this area were the Archaean, the Woodland, the Mississippian, and the Cherokee. And as we go through this area right here, it talks about the similarities and the differences in how they would create their pottery and other items. For example, right here, this would be the Archaic, and it actually says that they didn't construct pottery using the traditional forms that we would think. Instead, they crafted soft, durable stone called soapstone into their dishes and containers. And this is a reproduction of what it might have looked like right here. Now this one's the most fascinating to me. They actually replaced the limestone with river mussel shells during the Mississippians. And it created a much different finish. But then they could actually fuse it and temper it and the shell could be crushed into a fine powder. Which would allow the potters to create a thinner, more attractive vessel. And this is an example of that. See, they were able to do more intricate designs. Now, I know that to us today, we just go and grab something from the store, but at the time of the Native Americans, they couldn't do that. So everything that they created, they had to make durable and make it last because they didn't want to have to be constantly having to make new dishes. So learning that was really cool to see how the evolution kind of changed from one tribe to the next. And then also how they took into consideration different things like aesthetics or durability. Those are things we don't have to go and worry about too much whenever we just go pick up some dishes at local Walmart. But dishes weren't the only thing that they had to construct. They also had to construct tools for hunting. And those drastically changed from one tribe to the next. They had spears, they had blowguns, all sorts of different kinds of things. And as you can see here, this one looks like it's made from just a cane that was completely hollow in the middle and then they would use these little tipped darts. Looks like we are moving into a structure. And as we can see from these, this actually shows the different construction of the different tribes homes that might have been in this area. Pretty interesting to see some of the similarities and again the differences. Here we learn a little bit more about all the different plants that they could find right here in the Smoky Mountains that they could turn around and use for medicines. Now, again, this is not something that we have to think about too much. We just go to the pharmacy and pick it up. But at the time, everything that they did had to come from stuff that was around them. So it's interesting to see the description of these plants right here to know that they really do have medicinal uses. And there's some of the things that we could find in our own backyards. Did you know that maple could be used to treat eyes? The sap would be rubbed over the eye, probably during the nighttime, to help ease eye pain. And willow bark was used to reduce fever and pain. Pretty crazy to think about that. I mean, that's not something that would commonly be even crossing our minds when we're walking through our yard. But we should maybe think about those things a little bit more. These clay pipes are actually on loan right now 
from a private resident. And it's really cool because clay pipes were actually a portion of the trade that Native Americans engaged in. And now we move into the Cades Cove area. And with that, we have some information about cabin life. Now it's pretty interesting to note that by the early 1900s, approximately 116 families were actually calling the Cades Cove area home. And they all lived in cabins, which would have had similar kinds of proportionment to this right here. It was pretty interesting to see when you go out to the Smoky Mountain National Park that several buildings still are intact for you to go out there and kind of peek in and actually visit some of the buildings. But if you're not able to make it out there or can't walk into those, this is a great way for you to see what a cabin might have looked like somewhat. And the best thing about it is, as you're going through here, you can read about each portion of the home and why it was important. Reading along as we look, it looks like the primary staples of the region were pork and corn, and it became known as the hog and hominy state. It was easier for them to keep pork because it didn't require refrigeration once it was cured. It was a little bit easier than beef. They also used a lot of things that were natural for the season, meaning walnuts for the fall, cured ham, pickled beets through the winter, and wild onions and grasses of spring brought in berries for juice and for food during the summer months. Now, as you can imagine, this was not the easiest of lives. You had to live through some of the brutal cold months and the super hot heat with no air conditioning and no actual heaters, only fireplaces like this. So you had to be hardy and ready for the challenge. But the people who lived here thrived and they persevered and they had a lot of wonderful stories to tell, which are kind of scattered throughout this museum. Now, what would some of those jobs those hard, difficult jobs have looked like. Any number of these items. Daily chores were scattered between harvesting and planting and plowing and mending fences, tending to livestock. All of these tasks had to be done by hand using these kind of tools. Now it says right here that they actually had schools operational until about the 1830s but they were never accounted for in any way, shape, or form. Most of them were dirt floor, very basic schools that would just use land that could no longer be harvested or cropped. And that's where they would do everything. We had the most basic of necessities and that's all they needed. Now right here, you can actually sit down and watch the video that shares lots of photos of the people who used to live in the area and see how times were oh so different back then. I've been here for about five or six minutes just watching the different photos and it's absolutely fascinating. Do I know who these people are? Absolutely not, but it's interesting to see how their lives were vastly different than ours are today. Now, I wasn't expecting this at all, but as I'm coming through this part, there is an entire section about women's suffrage and the right to vote. And I think that that's pretty awesome. So they have these big signs that are like this and some information about the pioneers from this area in that department. So the woman who really stood up and tried to get our rights to vote. And we're oh so thankful for each and every one of them, obviously, but I'm gonna share a little bit about them too. So right here we have three different women and all of these were very, very important to the Tennessee communities. This is Abby Crawford Milton. She was actually the youngest in the movement and she led forces for women's suffrage and ran for state senate. Then this is Ann Davis who became the third woman to be elected to the Tennessee state legislature and during her term, she would sponsor the legislation which would allow the purchase of 78,000 acres of land from the Little River Lumber Company. And it would be the Great Smoky Mountains Park. That's awesome. And then there's Willem Accord Blake Eslick, and she actually was the first woman to be elected to Congress from Tennessee. A 
Okay, after exploring inside, we move outside to several additional buildings. And I'm really excited about these guys. The inside had tons of information, so I can only imagine as we move from building to building, our mind is going to be blown. The lady at the desk told me that there are tons of different things here, and so it's gonna take us a little while to explore. And I am up for the challenge. Arriving at building one right here, we have this old beat up Chevy. Wow, this thing looks like it has definitely seen better days, but it's really cool to see it out here. And here we go with building number one. Now the nice things about each one of these buildings is it actually has the name of the building up here and who made this possible. And then you can kind of see a photo from the past that might be connected to either the people who have made it possible or the building itself. We are currently in the still. According to this, it is the best kept secret of the Smoky Mountains and is still infamous to this day. Now during the Great Depression, this became the leading industry of the area. Moonshine or white lightning was coming out of here right and left, but at the same time it was also one of the biggest areas for law enforcement to really move in and try to capture all of those shiners out there. This tells us a little bit more about the process that involved water, sugar, and corn and kerosene to fuel the fire. It was a considerable time and organization that was taken to create moonshine and it would also be up to 90 degrees in a room like this so it had to be vented out. Now, of course, we have seen many, many takes on the moonshining industry, on movies and TV shows. So we're all kind of familiar with it. However, it's really cool to come into an actual still that isn't just some backwoods still that you would see them portraying on the movies. Those did exist too, but places like this were more apt to produce larger quantities. Now on the top side of the still, we have all of these. Some really cool ones, guys. Very cool to see these different kinds of wagons. But we do get a good glimpse into that still from below through this vent shaft area. Okay, guys, so we have social distancing now. There's no one out here other than me, so I did remove my mask. If I encounter someone else, I'll put it back on. But, it's nice to take in the smells of this garden. <sighs> it's amazing. They have the fresh fruits on one side of the garden and these flowers throughout that just make it smell heavenly. And there's a sign at the beginning that talks about why they created this garden using the plants that they did. Basically, they're all native to this area and so kind of just makes sense. We're preserving the history and we're preserving the whole vibe of this area. Now this is an interesting one. The outhouse is made possible through Brenda Sellers. And her quote here is funny. May your life be like a roll of toilet paper, long and useful. <laughs> Meanwhile, let's open it up and see what we find. Oh, yep, yep, it's an outhouse. Look at all of that interesting toilet paper stuff. Man. Sometimes it would just be better if I had someone traveling with me. Then I could do one of these. It's time now to move inside. And this looks like a porch that I want to sit on. Now, as we move around inside each one of these buildings, they are filled with little hidden gems. Everything from the kind of 
careful placement of the items in the kitchen to the linens that they use on the bed. Everything has significance. So as you kind of move around, you can see a glimpse at what it would have been like, but also see a little bit more about the family that might have lived in this home. And here next to this remnant of what looks like old newspaper, actually it talks about how newspapers were used for wallpaper. This was the Cardwell family and James, the father, actually built this cabin for his family's first home. Want to know how that they cured their meat so that they could keep it for a much longer amount of time? A place like this. This is the smokehouse. And this was quite a busy place leading up to the winter months where they would try to put away as much as they possibly could. And I'm not sure if you can see this or not, but it is definitely starting to sprinkle on us again. But we're going to move under the pole barn, so we'll be okay. This is the Maples Pole Barn. And as you can see, its structure is kind of baffling. They have these areas right here and here that hold up this, which has a massive overhang. And these are not small poles. These are quite large. This is where we would find the chickens, the pigs, anything that they could put in here really. And it would have gone in there. Now it is kind of fascinating because according to the information that they provided, 90% of the barns that were built like this are found right here in Sevier County, which is crazy to think that of all the places in the entire country that that many of them would be concentrated in one area. Now this is an interesting sign. This more than likely means that they would have let out space in this building. So inside here we would have found additional space for others. Now this is kind of interesting. This is a trundle of sorts, but this bed right here is actually made with rope. I don't know how comfortable I feel sleeping on this bed knowing that somebody above me is only suspended by some rope. Again, a very interesting hearth designed with what looks like river stones here. And then you would have all of the things that you could cook with or tend the fire with around. And then up top we would have a lantern which would probably work off of, I think, kerosene maybe. Okay, we encountered someone else, so we're back to safety first. That way, if they come up on us, we're good and they're good, because I saw they had masks too. You know, it's just about being proactive. Doing your part, super simple. It's not that hard to just put on a mask. We are now entering the church. Here we find the cornerstone of Wilder's Chapel, and this was the Zion Church, 1910. And this is the Reverend Andy and Mrs. Weir from about 1900. He was one of the pastors that was actually here in this very church. Now one of the kind of neat things about some of the structures I've noticed is they have been equipped with electricity so that they can light them up for tours at night or for use like this where they could play music that might have actually been played during the church services. So that's really really cool and a neat touch. Most of the time when you go to a historic building they're just a historic building. You, you don't really get an experience there but here they're really trying to recreate that history so you can be there and feel it and see it in a variety of different ways. So that's A1. Next up is this very large structure. Another kind of barn. Not sure what kind, so let's go and find out. This is a cantilever barn and it was a gift from Greg Vitell. It says right here his story of why he wanted to bring this to life here. This large cantilever barn would have actually held horses and cows and also mules and had plenty of room to store hay in the overhang above us, 
which would be right up here. Additionally, it says that in later years that some of these areas were actually expanded for storage and that they would dry tobacco and things like that in them. Now we are entering the wheelwright shop, which is one of the larger structures on the property. Now this particular wheelwright shop was brought here by a descendant of someone who lived in Cades Cove. So it has a really cool history that connects. And that's what the lady in the front was telling me is a lot of these people who've contributed have connecting pieces and that's why they're involved. Now inside the wheelwright shop, you can actually learn how a wheel was made. And it looks like it was a five step process overall. Now, why is it so large? <laughs> well, good question. They have to be able to facilitate not only the big equipment that they use, but also the items that they're working on. So if that means that they're working on a wagon, a wagon has to be able to come in. If they're working on a sleigh, a sleigh has to come in and so on and so forth. So these buildings were typically much larger than other structures in the area. According to the census of 1820, 52 wagon smiths and two wheelwrights operated in 27 different establishments that looked like this. Blacksmiths would have also worked inside one of these buildings with these other people. They would share the space because they had similar tools. So you could find some more information about being a blacksmith in here as well, which I wasn't expecting. Let's find out why iron workers are called blacksmiths. Right here, because iron is black. Okay, that, that seems easy enough. In 1924, horseshoes and nails for one horse cost 80 cents. How much do you think they cost in 1977? $8. What kind of inflation is that? Just behind that, we find another small home. And this is really a tiny house. But considering it's so tiny, it has a place setting for four people. Where would they have all slept? Down this long breezeway, we have the sawmill project. And inside this building, we can see what a sawmill of the time might have looked like. Massive, just massive. Look at that saw blade. Oh look guys, this is the print shop. And this is one of my favorite things at any historic site because as a person who formerly worked in the press, I love me a good print shop. The smell of the ink on these old machines just makes me so happy. Now within this building, we can find a very vast history of the Maryville Times. And as you can see here, we walk through the humble beginnings where it started out. A series of different owners that might have taken over and published new and exciting news on the regular. And then way down here, we happen into the current day Maryville Times and how it has continued to thrive since way back in the 1800s. Okay guys, we are moving on to the final building. We just stopped back into the visitor center and got some good information on some cool things that we're going to be doing while we're here in the Smoky Mountain area. I'm really excited and I am so thankful for the ladies in there because they had tons of useful information. Let's go into the transportation gallery. Oh, wow, look at this. This is cool, guys. I was not expecting there to be this many different things in here. Let's find out a little bit more about Tennessee on the move. Okay, first off, we have a scale, and this is really cool. I wonder what exactly that they would weigh with this. It's huge. Now something to note, as you're going through the Smoky Mountains, the question will go through your mind, how on earth did they make these roads? They're hairpin turns that just make you clinch whenever you go around them. Now picture the road before it was a real road. Yeah, it would have been terrifying. So one of the things that I like about coming in here is it actually explains how that they would have created those roads for us to drive on today because somebody had to do it and it couldn't have been a glamorous or fun job. You have to be super brave to do that job. Like I can't imagine clinging to the side of the mountain on a rail with a grater on it. No. 
Now, if you'll notice on this one right here, you actually see a little QR code. And you know I like me a good QR code. Now this one we can scan and find out a little bit more about the East Tennessee roads and what kind of conditions they might have had to go through. And around the room there are others as well. The road scraper and also the McClung wagon. Those both have QR codes to learn more about also. Look at that one right there. That is an old mail car. Now, for those of you who don't know, my dad is a postman and he drives a Jeep. It is rugged and goes well over the crazy roads that he has to drive on, but I can't imagine that he would enjoy driving on those wheels right there. And it only costs $56.90 for one of those mail delivery trucks. That was a lot of money back then though. Here we have a 1914 Ford Model T wagon truck. This one was discontinued, this kind of model, in 1927. This is what a wheelchair would have looked like back in the day. And here's another one right here also. And then look at this dapper horse right here, pulling this massive, massive wagon. Or is this a carriage? I think this is a carriage. Now, this one in particular is not labeled. However, this one is, and it's called a Surrey. So maybe this is a Surrey. It says by definition that the Surrey was a more elaborate wagon. So it would be outfitted with comfortable seats and uh, ornate details and things like that. Then right here, we have a 1953 Chevy Bel Air. And look at that, there's even the little window sticker still available. This whole car was $2,075. Oh my gosh. And just to kind of give you a heads up, this was only the second all new model after World War II that came out. Now this seems a little out of place in here because this is transportation and this is definitely a cannon. But, you know, it does have wheels, so maybe, maybe that's why, I'm not sure. Can you imagine a massive cannonball coming out of this? I hope that you have enjoyed coming with me today on this little adventure little cheeks are rosy from wearing my mask but all in all it has been a wonderful amazing happy day that started out a little odd because of the rain and the closures but we found something to make it work and boy am I happy we did this was a wonderful stop in the Smoky Mountains and a great introduction into some future adventures that we have coming up so I can't wait to share those with you too if you liked today's video make sure that you leave a thumbs up and also subscribe to my channel for more adventures not only here in Tennessee but across the United States Till next time, guys. Bye!